Welcome to Brush and Overlay Cafe, where you'll learn all things Photoshop. If you're a beginner, today's video is for you. In an era of smartphone photography and digital imaging, the ability to edit and enhance photos has become essential. Photoshop enables users to retouch images, remove imperfections, adjust colors, and manipulate visuals to create stunning and professional looking photographs. Welcome! Today is the day that we finally demystify Photoshop. I've divided this video into sections. Each section is timestamped below so you can easily navigate to the specific sections of the video that you want to watch. It also helps make it easier for you to go back and re-watch the parts that you're learning. So let's go ahead and jump right in. When you open Photoshop, you'll see the toolbar on the top. Let's take a brief look at some of the tools on the toolbar. The first option on the toolbar is File. Let's take a look at that and we'll create a brand new file. So click on New and it'll take you to this screen where you'll choose the size and resolution of your document. Right now, I have my size set to pixels, but you can change that if you want. So I'll choose inches and let's say I want an eight by 10. So I'll type in my width and height as eight by 10. You can also choose your background contents. Right now it's set to white and that's fine or I could choose something else. Maybe I want a transparent background. If I wanna see how many pixels an eight by 10 is, I can just convert this back to pixels and we can see an eight by 10 translates to 2400 by 3000 pixels. You could also change the resolution if you wanted. Generally speaking, 300 PPI or pixels per inch is a good resolution for printing. Or if your image will just be displayed on the web, 72 pixels per inch is fine for that. Now click on create and there you go. You've created a document and this is where you'll work on whatever photo or design you want to make. To open a photo, click on file, choose place embedded. Navigate to where your photo is saved and click Place. Click the check mark above. On the toolbar, click Image and scroll to Image Size. You can see the image opened into the 8x10 that we chose earlier. An alternative way to open a photo from the home screen is to click on File and this time choose Open. Navigate to your photo, click on it, and select Open. This time, if we click on image in the toolbar, then select image size, you can see the image opened in its original size. To save your work, again, you'll do this under the file tab. Select save as and choose the location on your computer you want it saved to. Name the file. You can choose your file type down here and click Save. As a beginner, that's basically all you'll need from the tabs at the top. The only other one you might use frequently would be the Image tab. And remember, this is where you'll adjust your size and resolution. Now let's get to the Fun toolbar. That's this one on the left. This is where all of your editing tools live. And I'll touch on just a few of the best ones for you to get started with. The first tool is the clone stamp tool and it's the one that looks like a rubber stamp and just like the pop out screen says, it paints pixels from another part of the image. The clone stamp tool is great for all sorts of things and cleaning up skin on portraits is one of those things. So let me show you how it works. We'll zoom in on where there are some areas of the skin to clean up. Hover your mouse or pen over a nice clean area of skin first then hold down the Alt key to select that as the area that you want to clone. Then let go and come over to the blemishes and just paint over top. You can see that since I made my selection from this shadowy area over here, when I painted over the top of the blemishes, those same dark pixels came over here, but I didn't want to clone the shadowy area. I should have selected the smooth skin closer to the blemishes so that it'll look right when I clone. This time, I'll click Alt and select from a better area. Then when I paint over, it looks perfect. So now I'll just continue Alt to select a nice area of skin and then go to clone that area by painting right over top of the part that you want to fix. Here's a before and after. 
Back to the original picture now. The spot healing brush is another tool that can be used for situations like this where you want to remove an unwanted element. Again, it's great for lots of things, but I'll demonstrate it here. And watch, all you have to do is click over top of the blemish and it disappears. Make sure your brush is slightly larger than the spot you're removing. What's happening is Photoshop automatically samples surrounding pixels and it blends them in to replace that whole area. Now onto the healing brush tool, which is slightly different than the spot healing brush tool that we just saw. The healing brush tool just looks like a band-aid with nothing else on it. So this tool removes imperfections by blending a selected area with a source area that you choose. And in this case, our source area is the nice clean skin. Uh, this provides more control over the correction. So once again, to select the source area, that nice clean skin, we're gonna do alt click and then let go and paint over the blemish. Again, alt click to select a nice clean area of skin, let go, paint over the blemish. So Photoshop is basically blending the pixels from the clean areas and the blemish areas to create a nice smooth transition. This is in contrast to the spot healing brush tool, which automatically samples only the surrounding pixels to remove the flaws without specifying a source area. So as you use these tools more and more, you'll find out that one may work better than the other in different situations. I suggest you just play around with these two tools and get a feel for how they work. Both the spot healing brush and the healing brush are useful in any situation where you have just a small area on a photo that you want to remove. Now on to the zoom tool. You may have noticed me using this a couple times already. It's the tool that looks like a magnifying glass. Click to select, then just go to the area you want to zoom in on. Each time you click within your image, it zooms closer. Once the zoom tool is selected, you'll also see zooming options appear at the top of your screen. The plus sign is for zooming in and the one with the minus sign is for zooming out. So I'll click on that. Then each time I click within the image, it zooms out a little farther. Fit screen is the default placement and fill screen fills up the entire viewing area. I often use fit screen to quickly reset. Alternatively, you could use keyboard shortcuts. Control plus zooms in, control minus zooms out. Again, I'll select fit screen to reset to the default view. Another tool you should know how to use is the crop tool. Here's what it looks like. When you click on it, this bounding box shows up around your image. On the top is where you can choose your ratio. Here's a one-to-one -one square. I think I'll choose 16 by nine. Click the check mark to accept. A keyboard shortcut to undo your last edit in Photoshop is Control Z. So up here are my ratio settings and I can click clear to reset. You can also just type in your desired size. So let's say I want to crop this photo to an eight by 10. I'll just type that in and click the check mark to accept. Again, Control Z to undo. Another option to the crop tool is to instead select the rectangular marquee tool. It just looks like a dotted rectangle on your toolbar. Click to select, then go into your image. Click and drag to create a box around your desired crop and then go to image, crop. And there's your newly cropped image. Now, one warning about this, if the original resolution of your photo is pretty low, especially if it's a cell phone image, cropping too much may create a very pixelated picture. So just keep that in mind and try to keep the crops as minor as possible. You may have heard of Photoshop as being a layers-based program, and here I'll show you what that means. This area over here is called the Layers panel. Notice when you open a picture that you want to edit in Photoshop, it appears in two forms, a large view and this view over here. This is called a layer. As you see, when you open your photo in Photoshop, it also appears as the background layer, and it's just automatically named background. Let's go ahead and edit this image. 
This is a photo I took with my phone while hiking this cool place called the Narrows in Utah. If you're not familiar, it's a really beautiful area. The first thing you may notice is where the sun was shining down onto the rock formations and the image is slightly overexposed in that spot as a result. I want to fix that because it not only washes out a lot of the detail in that area, but it also draws the eye up there immediately, which is not necessarily why, where I want the viewer to be focused on right away. One of my favorite things about Photoshop is there's not just one way to do any given edit. There are always many options to choose from and many different ways to use your own creativity. So I'm going to show you three different ways that we can change the lighting in this image. The first tool we'll look at is the brightness and contrast tool. It's the one that looks like a sun. By the way, you'll find all of these tools in the adjustments panel under single adjustments. Notice when you click on the tool, a new layer appears on the layers panel above the background layer. This new layer is the brightness contrast layer, which we'll be working on. The first thing I'll do is use the slider to turn down the brightness and I may also want to adjust the contrast. Obviously every image is different, so you just go with what looks good. If you click on the eyeball on the bottom of the pop-out window, you can toggle to view a before and after. You can see the overexposed area on the top does look much better, but unfortunately the brightness adjustment affected the entire image, which is not what we wanted. I'll talk about how to fix that in a bit, but for now I just want you to be aware of some of the different tools that you'll use to adjust lighting. You can click undo down here, and I'm going to X out of this. And to get rid of this brightness contrast layer that I no longer want, I'm just going to click and drag it to the trash can icon below. Now we'll move on to a second way to adjust the lighting in your image. This is called a levels adjustment. And I like this one better because it gives you more control over the output. When you click on the levels adjustment tool, you get a histogram that pops up. The histogram visually represents the distribution of tones or brightness levels in an image. So it displays shadows on the left, midtones in the middle, and highlights on the right. And adjusting the sliders beneath the histogram lets you control the image's contrast and tonal balance. So you have a lot more control here. In this image, here are the highlights that I'm going to want to bring down. Midtones would be like the rocks down here, some of the middle tones in these rock formations, and then the shadowy areas represented on the left of the histogram would be mostly these areas right in here. I'm going to grab the midtone slider and move to the right to bring those midtones down a little bit. Now, if I move the highlight slider to the left, notice it makes the highlights brighter. And if I move the left slider in, it makes the shadowy areas darker. That's not what I want in this case. I want to bring the highlights down. So for that, I'll use the slider below. Click and drag, and now the highlights come down. And again, you can toggle the eyeball down below for a before and after. You can continue adjustments if you need to. So this previously overexposed area now looks better, but once again, the adjustment affected the entire image. And like I said, there's a fix for that, and I'll explain that in just a bit. But for now, let's get rid of this layer that we no longer need. And once again, I'm just going to click and drag it down to the garbage can. The last tool that I'm going to show you that you would use to adjust lighting and tones in Photoshop is called the Curves Adjustment Tool. And that's this one right here. When I click on that, notice once again we get a histogram. And just like before, the histogram on the Curves Adjustment Tool illustrates the tonal distribution of the image. So it displays shadows, midtones, and highlights. Manipulating the curve on this tool allows you to fine tune specific tonal ranges and enhance contrast, adjust brighting levels with really nice precision. So this is a great tool to use. I'm going to start by clicking on that hand up above in the upper left hand corner and then watch what happens. When I come over to the image and move the mouse or pen, whatever you're using, around the image, notice that circle on the histogram is traveling along with my mouse to the tonal areas that it represents in the image. So when I hover my mouse over a shadowy area, that circle travels down to the lower left-hand corner, 
mid-tone areas, the little circle travels more in the middle. And then when I go up into the highlighted areas of the image, the circle goes to the right and up. So as you travel up and to the right, you get lighter and lighter tonal values in the image. Down and to the left on the histogram represents the darker tonal values and the shadowy areas. I'm going to bring the midtones down first. So I'm just going to click the middle of the adjustment curve line and drag those midtones down. Then I'm going to adjust the highlights up and to the right. I'll just drag those down. Come back and make some more adjustments in the midtones. So now you can see both the midtones and the highlights in the image have been taken down a notch, which looks a lot better. And then again, I'm going to click on the eyeball for a before and after. If you just focus on those overexposed areas on the top, they do look better. But once again, obviously, same problem as before. And we will fix that, the fact that it's affecting the entire image. And now it's finally time to learn about layer masks. Using layer masks is how you're going to fix the problem of having your edit affect the entire image. You're going to be able to now have it just affect the parts that you want. I'm going to create that same curves adjustment. So once again, when you click, here is the histogram that you're going to be working with. And I want to brighten up just the midtones around the water. So I'm going to grab my midtones and just pull up on the bar slightly. And once again, you can click the eyeball to see a before and after. You can also click the eyeball over here on the active layer, which is the curves adjustment layer. And notice how you have sort of two icons on the curves adjustment layer. This first one is a mini version of that histogram that we see when we open up the curves adjustment. And then the second one is just this box filled with white. That is actually called a layer mask and that's where all the magic happens. That's what you're gonna be learning. So when I click back over here, you'll see it's kind of surrounded by a box. And now when I click on the layer mask, now that is surrounded by a box. So you wanna make sure that you're clicking on whichever one you're working on either the adjustment itself on the left or the layer mask on the right. Make sure you've clicked on the one that you're wanting to work on. The biggest thing to remember when you're working with layer masks is remember this phrase, white reveals, black conceals. White reveals, black conceals. And I'll show you what I mean. Notice when my layer mask was white, the adjustment that I made showed up over the entire image. Since the entire layer mask is white, the entire image is affected. Then when I do control I on my keyboard, I for invert, it changed the layer mask to black. Black concealed the adjustment that I made throughout the entire image since the entire mask is black. So white revealed my adjustment and black concealed my adjustment. Now that curves adjustment isn't showing up on any of the image. So now I get to paint the adjustment wherever I want it to be. So in order to do that, I'm going to grab the paintbrush and it just looks like a paintbrush. So that's pretty easy to find. And then up here, you'll also find some of the settings for the brushes. You can change the size with the slider and a keyboard shortcut to change the size of your brush is the right and left bracket keys. The right one makes it bigger and the left one makes it smaller. Now we're ready to paint in that adjustment we made where I lifted up the midtones to make them a little lighter. In order to paint it in, remember now our mask is black. That adjustment isn't showing up anywhere. So now we want certain areas to be white. So I'm going to come down here to my foreground and background colors. I'm going to make my foreground white. To do that, you could just toggle where these two arrows are. The default is black and white. And the one that's on the top is your foreground color. So that's the one that you want to be white. Now I'm just going to come in here and paint that adjustment that I made where I lifted the midtones right where I want it to be. And I only wanted the area around the water affected. So see how when I paint that on, it shows up as white as the mask. So anything that's white on that mask is revealing the adjustment that I made. So I'm just gonna continue to click and drag with my mouse or your pen. And now we can look at uh, before and after. 
by clicking on that eyeball again and notice that everywhere that I painted on the image is now white on the mask. So those areas are revealing the curves adjustment that I made. And now those midtones are lifted in just the areas that I wanted. I'm going to reset to black now to show you another way that you can paint in your edit. Remember, since the mask is now black, that means none of my curves adjustment that I did earlier is showing up anywhere on the image. So let's again grab a brush and I'm going to make sure the foreground is white. And this time, instead of clicking and dragging on the image where I want the adjustment to appear, instead I'm just going to click and just kind of very quickly click, click, click where I want it to be. So I'm going to grab some of these highlights and lighter midtones and just click right on top of those and let go. So I'm not dragging my mouse at all. I'm just clicking in some areas that are already light in the image. Um, and I just want to bring them out a little bit more. This is the technique that I prefer. I feel like it gives you a little bit more control and it just looks better overall. Uh, it looks more like dappled lighting. So here's a before and after. And then once again, if you look at the layer mask, you can see that everywhere that I clicked with my brush is now white on the layer mask. So that is revealing the edit. I'm going to go ahead and delete this adjustment now. So I'm just going to drag it down to the garbage can below again. And I'm just going to demonstrate one more thing. Back to the curves adjustment layer. And this time what I'm going to do is lift up some of the lighter midtones. So right in between the midtones and the highlights. And then I'm going to come down here and darken some of the darker midtones. So I'm not going all the way up to the highlights or all the way down to the shadows. What I've created is what we call an S curve. It's somewhat in the shape of an S. So here's a before and after. And you notice that just creates a very contrasty image. So once again, I'm going to go to my white layer mask. So this is showing up all over the image and I'm going to control I to switch it to black. So now it's concealed. And once again, I'll choose my brush with a white foreground and I'm just going to paint in this effect wherever I want it, just like we did before. I'm using a combination of swiping with my mouse and just clicking. And this time, because we brought down those darker midtones a little bit, it's going to create a slightly warmer look in the image. I'm using my left and right bracket keys to change the size of my brush and once again a before and after and that is it congratulations you've learned all of the basic tools that you're going to need to get started in photoshop i hope you enjoyed this video i hope you found it helpful and there's much more to come whether you're a beginner intermediate or advanced in photoshop make sure you subscribe because i'm going to have something for everybody